Good afternoon, everybody. This this will be the IRTF open meeting. Uh, can I just check the audio is working in the room and for the remote people? All right. So in that case, we should get started. Uh, Welcome. Uh, this is the IRTF Open Meeting at IRTF 117 in San Francisco. Uh, my name is Colin Perkins. I'm the IRTF Chair, and uh, I'll, I'll be running this meeting today. So I'd like to start with the, the usual administrative uh, uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, a reminder that the IRTF follows the IETF's intellectual property disclosure rules. So by participating in, in this meeting and in the other IRTF meetings taking place this week, you agree to, to follow the uh, disclosure uh, processes and policies, uh, and in particular, if you're aware that any, any contributions you make are covered by patents or patents applications that are owned or controlled by you or by your sponsor, then you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. And the links on the slide have uh, full details of the policy. In addition, I'd like to remind you that uh, we routinely make uh, recordings of uh, these meetings uh, and that these meetings will be uh, recorded and, and the recordings will be published online. If you don't want to uh, uh, be photographed or recorded, then um, you can wear one of the red do not photograph lanyards. Um, However, I, I will remind you that this meeting is going out live um, on the streaming and will be on YouTube. So if you um, make comments at the microphone, uh, then you are likely to be uh, recorded. And, and as I say, this meeting is being recorded and it is being live streamed. In addition, I'd like to uh, remind you of the code of conduct. Um, you know, it is uh, important that we all work respectfully with each other. Um, in these meetings, and we try to make this a, a pleasant environment for everyone. So please do uh, follow the code of conduct. Um, if you have any concerns about the behavior of any of the participants, uh, please either contact me or contact the Ombuds team, and the, the contact details are on the slide. The uh, full links to the code of conduct, the anti-harassment procedures are located on the slide there as well. Also a reminder that any personal information you provide uh, when you registered, for example, will be handled in accordance with the privacy policy specified. Finally, uh, in-person participants, uh, in order that we can keep track of who's attending these meetings uh, and so we can get an appropriately sized room next time, please do uh, sign in, uh, either by scanning the QR code on the screen at the front, uh, or, or by uh, scanning the, the QR code on the blue sheet that uh, is about to start circulating, or by signing in via the data tracker. So, um, you, you, if, if once you sign into MeetEcho, then that will uh, record your attendance and uh, ensure we get an appropriately sized room in future. Uh, remote participants, uh, make sure your audio and video are turned off unless you're uh, uh, actively trying to talk. And we, we will. And for, for, for everybody, we'll be using a single unified queue. So if you want to join the queue and ask questions, then you should uh, do so in MeetEcho, um, either on your phone or, or using the full client on your laptop. Uh, and then we'll ma manage a single queue for both the local and the remote participants. OK, so this is the IRTF open meeting. Um, so what is the IRTF? Well, the IRTF is a, a parallel organization to the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, that focuses on longer-term research issues and challenges. It's very much a research organization. The IRTF is not a standards development organization and cannot publish standards track RFCs. We can publish informational or experimental documents in the RFC series. Uh, we do that on occasion. We have a I will mention a few of those that have been published by the IRTF uh, recently in a later slide. But the primary output of the research groups is much more commonly uh, understanding and research results that are dis disseminated by publishing papers rather than by publishing RFCs. So the usual output from the research groups is papers rather than RFCs, which is the typical output from the IETF. 
The IRTF is organized as a number of research groups. Um, there are, uh, I think, 16 research groups currently active. Um, those highlighted in dark blue on the slide are still to meet. Uh, we have the network management research group uh, in a couple of hours time. Uh, and then tomorrow morning, we have the measurement and analysis of protocols group and the privacy, privacy enhancements and, and assessments research group. Those highlighted in lighter blue met earlier this week. Uh, and I'm afraid you've missed them, but you can catch up with the meetings on, on the YouTube recordings. And those in gray are not meeting this time. A small bit of research group news. Um, I'm uh, saddened to announce that uh, Jana Ayenga and Michael Shapira are both uh, stepping down as ICCRG chairs. Um, thank you both uh, for your service. Uh, Jana especially has been uh, chairing that group for about the last decade or so uh, and has made a, a tremendous uh, uh, contribution to the uh, to, to that research group and to the IRTF. Uh, Michael joined more recently, but has also made a, a great contribution in the time he was available. Uh, both, of these, uh, both of these people have had uh, um, changes in their day jobs and increases in their workload that meant they had to, to step down from the, the chairing this group. Uh, Simone Ferlin will continue as the co-chair of the Congestion Control Research Group, uh, and we're also looking to appoint uh, some additional chairs there. So if, if you're interested or if you have uh, suggestions for who would make a good chair for that group, uh, then please do get in touch with me. In addition, uh, I am... Um, I guess pleased because it has completed its work, but saddened because we are losing a research group uh, to, to announce that the, the coding for network uh, communications, the network coding research group will be closing after this meeting uh, because it's finished its work. Thank you very much to the two chairs of that group recently, uh, Vincent Roca and Marie-José Montpetit, uh, to the, all the current and the past participants in the group. Um, it's been a very successful group. Uh, it's produced a number of documents which have been published as RFCs, including a, a couple that have just been, uh, finished the publication process and been published in the last few weeks. Coincidentally, there was a, a, a really nice uh, survey uh, came out of uh, a seminar series at Technical University of Munich, uh, which uh, um, Marie Jose found uh, a few weeks back, uh, which talks about the, the work of the group and surveys the, the progress it's made over the last few years. Uh, and I would, uh, if you're interested in the, the topic of network coding, I'd encourage you to look at the results of the group, look at the survey, which uh, discusses what the group did. Um, in fact, they're a very successful group. Um, as I say, a number of, of good documents, a lot of good understanding came out of them. So thank you to, to Vincent and Marie Jose uh, and to all the rest of the participants there. Finally, uh, I'd just like to mention that the um, Decentralized Internet Infrastructure Research Group has just completed a, re a um, a, a rechartering, uh, which was approved by the Internet Architecture Board earlier this week. Um, the details of the charter um, are, are on the data tracker. The, the key change is, is that the group has changed its name from Decentralized Internet Infrastructure to be the, the decentralization of the Internet Research Group. The the, this, this reflects a shift in the emphasis of the group's work over the last few years. Um, originally, when it was chartered, this group very much focused on decentralized technologies and protocols, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer systems, blockchain-based systems, distributed ledger systems, and, and so on, um, with a minor focus on the various economic aspects and economic drivers and roadblocks. Over the years, the focus of the group has gradually shifted away from the protocols and technologies and more towards the, the economic aspects of, of centralization and decentralization and understanding the drivers for, for the changes in, in the, the internet and, uh, and, and, and the way the internet and its protocols have developed. Um, and this change in, in the charter and this recharter just reflects that shift um, towards the, you know, the, the, the non-protocol aspects of uh, centralization, I guess. So I'm looking forward to the, the, the work from that group. They had a, a really nice meeting earlier this week. Uh, with, uh, we had a talk from Cory Doctoro, um, which was really nice about um, sort of some of the, um, the, the drivers um, for centralization uh, and some nice economics talks as well. So um, I, I'd encourage you to look at the, the recording of that session and, uh, and to participate in the group going forward.
as I said, the, the main focus of the IRTF is more on research papers and understanding and less on uh, publishing RFCs, but the IRTF can publish RFCs. And uh, in, the, in the last few, few months since the, uh, the previous meeting, we, we, we have published several RFCs. Uh, two of these, the, the Tetris on the Fly Network Coding Protocol uh, and the BATS Coding Scheme for, for Multi-Help Transport uh, are, are the last two outcomes of the Network Coding Research Group uh, and are both Network Coding Protocols. And the uh, Privacy Enhancements and Assessments Group also published a couple of RFCs on um, the history and use of transient numeric identifiers and some of the privacy challenges in um, generating and using ID protocol identifiers. So please do have a look at those. Um, a couple of, you know, some nice RFCs coming out of the, the IRTF there. In uh, addition to the research groups, we also organize um, the Applied Networking Research Prize and the Applied Networking Research Workshop. The Applied Networking Research Prize uh, recognizes some of the best recent results in applied networking. Um, it recognizes interesting new research ideas, um, which are potentially of relevance to the standards community. And it recognizes some of the upcoming people that, that we hope will have an impact on internet standards and technologies in the coming years. We're very proud to uh, organize this award. Uh, we're very grateful to the Internet Society, uh, to Comcast and to NBC Universal, who support us in this activity and, and make it possible. Uh, I think it's a, a really great award. It's been running for a, a number of years now. We've had some, some fantastic papers and, and some fantastic people uh, receive these awards so far. We're going to be making two awards today. Um, again, two, two fantastic papers, uh, two fantastic people uh, getting the awards today. Uh, Simon Scherer uh, will be receiving the award uh, for his work on modeling uh, the BBR congestion control algorithm. And Shiva uh, Kakala will, be, uh, uh, will, will also receive the, work, the award for his work uh, verifying the correctness of name servers. The papers and the slides are, are all up on the website, uh, and um, we are going out live uh, now, and the recording will also be on YouTube uh, afterwards. So uh, we'll look out for that uh, in, in a couple of minutes. And as I say, it's a fa fantastic talk. We also organized the Applied Networking Research Workshop. Um, that took place uh, on Monday this week. It's an, an annual event which we, we organize in conjunction with ACM SIGCOM. The ANRW is a, an academic workshop. Uh, the papers, uh, the proceedings are published uh, in the ACM Digital Library, and it's a, a peer-reviewed workshop. Um, as I say, we, we had a fantastic workshop on Monday. Uh, we had a, a great keynote uh, from Dave Levin, a uh, really nice panel discussion um, about the future uh, of the internet, uh, and a bunch of really good research papers. Um, so I'm, I'm really pleased by how, how well that came out. Thank you very much to the organizers there, uh, Francis Yan from Microsoft Research and Mar Maria Apostolaki from Princeton uh, for all their effort putting that together. Thank you to the reviewers, to the authors, to the speakers. Uh, as I say, it was a, a fantastic workshop this week. And uh, if you were not able to attend, please do um, look at the papers. Uh, the program link is linked from the slide here. Or watch the recordings that are on YouTube and, and are also linked from the program page. I'm also pleased to announce that the 2024 Applied Networking Research Workshop will co-locate with the Vancouver IETF next summer, uh, I guess in the, the, the northern summer ne next year in uh, July 2024. Um, the organizers there will be Simone Ferlin from Red Hat, uh, Ignacio Castro from Queen Mary University of London. Um, no details on, on the website yet, but uh, the, the link on the website will become live in, in a few weeks. Um, so, so please do look out for the, the details and the call for paper for that workshop in, in, the, coming, uh, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, and I, I expect that to be, a, again, a, a fantastic workshop. We've got a couple of great organizers there, so uh, we should have a really nice set of papers. And I'm also uh, very pleased to, to, to say that we, we have uh, managed to offer a significant number of travel grants to attend uh, this meeting today uh, and, and the, the, the meetings this week. 
Um, we provide travel grants for early career, career academics and for PhD students uh, with a particular focus for, for, uh, for a particular focus on those from underrepresented groups uh, to be able to attend the, the IRTF meetings uh, co-located with the I, IETF. Uh, I think we're able to award 12 travel grants this time, so, so uh, we've uh, had a, a fantastic uh, uh, set of people. Um, and I am very grateful to, to Akamai, to Comcast, and to Netflix for the sponsorship that makes this possible. Um, Look out again uh, for details of the travel grants for the, the coming IETF and IRTF meetings in Prague later this year. The details are, will become available on, on the link on the slide uh, again in a few weeks' time. Uh, thank you to the sponsors, and please, please contact me or co contact Stephanie from the Secretariat if you are, are interested in helping expand these programs. All right, so that's all I have to say. Um, our agenda for today, um, in we we have uh, the the, um, the 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 applied networking research prize talk from Simon Scherer uh, in an, in a second. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be talking about model based insights, performance and fairness, and stability of BBR. Uh, we were supposed to have the the second award talk from uh, Shiva Kakala. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Shiva has uh, gotten sick and is unable to attend today, so we will have to to reschedule that uh, to the I guess to the November meeting. Um, so uh, um, I'd like to invite uh, Simon up to to, to give his uh, award talk. All right. Let me get the slides and then I will introduce you. Okay, so uh, this is uh, pleased to announce uh, uh, that the, the award talk uh, today is given by Simon Scherer. Simon is a 50 year PhD student in the network security group at ETH Zurich, um, and he's advised by, where, where he's advised by Adrian Perrig. In his research, uh, Simon has specialized in modeling network dynamics, including congestion control, path selection, and ISP competition. His award talk is entitled Model Based Insights on the Performance, Fairness, and Stability of uh, the BBR Congestion Control Protocol. Uh, it's based on a paper which was originally presented in the ACM Internet Measurement Conference uh, last November, I think it was. So, Simon, over to you. Okay, so hey, uh, hello everyone. Uh, before I start, I would like to express my enormous gratitude uh, to the IRTF uh, for the ANRP and for the opportunity to present uh, my work here today. Specifically, I would like to um, present my work on model-based insights on the performance, fairness, and stability of BBR. In summary, in this work, we construct the first fluid model for the BBR congestion control algorithm. We experimentally validate this model, and we derive new insights from it. To start, I would first like to take a look back at the journey of BBR so far. So BBR is a relatively recent congestion control algorithm. It has first been presented by Google in 2016. However, BBR is already widely used. It was uh, quickly enabled for YouTube and uh, by the most recent estimates covers around uh, or is used by around 40% of downstream internet traffic today. BBR is still under ongoing development, uh, which is demonstrated by the release of BBR version two uh, in 2019. And I learned uh, just this week that BBR version three is now very much on its way. This ongoing development of BBR has partially been driven by the research community, which has contributed to uh, the under understanding of BBR uh, over the years in various ways. However, this previous research leaves open uh, some important questions. And these open questions have to, be, uh, have to do with the approaches that were taken by this previous research. And these approaches come in two broad categories. The first approach in previous research are experimental evaluations, where the actual BBR implementation is tested in real physical network settings. Now, to gain general insights from these experimental evaluations, uh, the BBR implementation, implementation has to be tested in a wide variety of network settings. And in this regard, 
the issue with experimental evaluation is there are scale dependent costs. So if the BBR implementation is to be tested in large scale networks or in high speed networks, these networks actually have to be physically built, which may be out of reach uh, for most researchers. That's where models come in. So in general, congestion control models try to mathematically describe the behavior of a congestion control algorithm and uh, can thus predict the algorithm's performance in yet unseen network settings. However, so far, only steady state models of BBR have been proposed. So models that describe the behavior of BBR in its static phase after convergence. These models uh, do not have a notion of time and therefore cannot express transient effects. Uh, for example, such as the convergence itself. However, understanding this conversion is actually, actually really important because um, the steady states in the steady state models are only relevant for performance if the algorithm can actually be shown to converge uh, to these steady states. In our work, we try to fill these gaps in previous research with a fluid model. In congestion control research, a fluid model describes a system of ordinary differential equations that it describes two pieces of joint dynamics. The first piece of dynamics relates to the behavior of the congestion control algorithms themselves, uh, which run at the sending node, and the differential equations thereby focus on the evolution of the sending rate over time. The second piece of dynamics in fluid models uh, covers the response of network metrics to the sending rates chosen by the uh, congestion control algorithms. Um, so for example, these differential equations describe the evolution of the Q length over time. And with this approach based on differential equations, fluid models have a number of advantages. First, they enable efficient evaluation as opposed uh, to experiments because the differential equations in the fluid models can actually be e efficiently solved for a wide range of network scenarios. Um, to illustrate this, uh, note that uh, traffic flows in fluid models um, are modeled as fluids and therefore do not have a notion of packet. Uh, and that means that simulating a large traffic flow is, is actually not more uh, computationally costly than simulating a small traffic flow because this boils ju just boils down to larger numbers in the same calculations. The second advantage is that fluid models, in fact, can express transient effects as opposed to steady state models and thereby allow to investigate uh, convergence behavior. Uh, even more importantly, uh, fluid models allow to rigorously prove whether an algorithm converges uh, to a steady state uh, by using methods from uh, theoretical stability analysis and control theory. So that's exactly what our work is about. So in our work, we construct a fluid model uh, that reflects BBR behavior. And to make that work, we had actually had to design some new modeling techniques. I will explain that afterwards. Um, we didn't only propose the fluid model, but we also validated it with measurements from actual experiments. And in the process of this validation, uh, we could confirm previous insights into PBR performance, but also generate new insights. And finally, we could also apply this uh, theoretical stability analysis to our fluid model and thereby prove that PBR in fact converges, or more technically, that the equilibria of the PBR dynamics are asymptotically stable. Now we'll go through each of these contributions one by one, and we will start with the design of the fluid model. Now I mentioned that we had to design some new techniques uh, to make, uh, to reflect BBR behavior with differential equations. And to explain why that is, I will first illustrate how congestion control functionality has traditionally been represented in fluid models. And I will do so at the example of the uh, traditional Reno algorithm. Now, as we all know, um, at the basis of Reno, there is a quite simple control loop. This control loop uh, man maintains a congestion window of, let's say, size W here. If an acknowledgement is received, this congestion window size is increased by one segment divided by the congestion window size. This translates to, uh, to an increase by one segment over roughly one, one round trip time. And otherwise, if a packet less occurs, the congestion window size is cut in half. Now, this control loop is uh, modeled as follows in the classic uh, fluid model by Stephen Lowe. So first, the sending rate x at any point in time is given by the congestion window size at any point in time divided by the delay tau at, at this point in time. Second, the congestion window size itself is described in its evolution by this differential equation here. Uh, 
Now, um, it's a differential equation. That's why there's a dot above the variable on the left-hand side. And this uh, differential equation gives the change in the congestion window size at any point in time t. So the right-hand side of this differential equation is quite complex. So let's go through it one by one. The first uh, factor in this first term here describes the share of non-loss traffic. So P is a function that gives the loss rate at time t, and P of t minus tau gives the loss rate one RTT a go. And one minus uh, this loss rate is the share of traffic that was not lost one RTT ago. Multiplying this with the sending rate x of one RTT ago, we get the rate of incoming x acknowledgements currently. And then we multiply this with the congestion window size increase upon received X, which then gives us the aggregate rate of congestion window size increase. Now turning to the second, uh, the second term, we again have the lost rate of one RTT ago. We multiply this with the sending rate of one RTT ago, and we again multiply this with the congestion window cut upon uh, loss, and thereby we get the aggregate rate of congestion window size de decrease. Now, this difference between the aggregate increase and the aggregate decrease is undoubtedly an approximation of actual renal behavior. But uh, surprisingly, we find that um, this, uh, this renal fluid model uh, reflects actual renal behavior quite well, uh, especially when we couple it with our network fluid model. However, uh, in summary, we see here that there is a single fundamental variable, namely the congestion window size W. And this congestion window size uh, is, adapt is adapted in response to loss. And that's actually not sufficient to reflect BBR behavior. And to see why, uh, I'll focus on a small but important part uh, of BBR functionality, namely the bandwidth probing in BBR version 1. And I will focus on how this bandwidth probing adapts the sending rate of a BBR flow over time. So fundamentally, BBR splits time into probing periods where each probing period consists of eight phases, and each phase has the duration of the minimum measured RTT, so this min uh, RTT here. Generally, in each of these eight phases, the BBR flow sends at the bottleneck, the sends at the rate that corresponds to the bottleneck bandwidth estimate, uh, denoted by P here. However, in one random phase, um, the rate is raised uh, by 25% to discover whether more bandwidth is available. In the subsequent phase, this rate is then reduced by 25% compared to the base rate to drain any queues that may have been built up before. As this probing goes on, and the delivery rate is observed, so the rate of incoming acknowledgments, and this delivery rate should roughly correspond to the sending rate of one RDT ago if there is no congestion. And the maximum of this delivery rate is then adopted as the new bottleneck bandwidth estimate denoted by B prime here. And this probing period, uh, probing process repeats in the next period. Now here we already see that there is not just one single fundamental variable that is adapted in response to loss, but that we have to model a quite different range of functionality. Um, specifically, we have to construct our uh, differential equations such that we can represent these probing pulses, such that we can insert these probing pulses into random phases, such that the maximum delivery rate is tracked over time and such that the bottleneck bandwidth estimate is periodically adjusted. And on the next few slides, uh, I will explain how we achieve this with um, uh, mathematical functions. So let's start with the probing pulses. In order to represent these probing pulses uh, with differential equations, we have to get a bit inventive with mathematical functions. For our purpose, we can use the well-known sigmoid function uh, which has this formula on the left side and um, increases from zero to one for an argument around zero. We use this sigmoid function to create a pulse function. Now for the pulses, uh, remember that BPR splits time into phases where each phase has the duration of the minimum measured round trip time uh, denoted by tau min here. Now let's say we want to insert a pulse into phase one. So to do that, we take a sigmoid function that increases at the start of phase one, we take another sigmoid function that decreases at the end of phase one, and we multiply these sigmoid functions to get a pulse that covers phase one. Now with such a pulse, we can augment the pacing rate uh, of any BBR flow. To that end, we start with the bottleneck uh, bandwidth estimate, uh, denoted by XBTL here, and this, is, this forms the base. And then we add a 25% pulse to it in one phase 
and subtract, subtract a 25% pulse from it in the next phase. And like this, we have represented these probing pulses uh, with differential equations. Now remember that these probing pulses have to be inserted into random phases. For example, if we have the pacing rate of flow I here, um, this, um, this uh, pacing rate has an upwards pulse in phase phi I, which is one here in this example, and a downwards pulse in phase phi I plus one, which is two in this example. Um, so this phi I has to be determined in the fluid model in a way that captures the randomness in VBR. Unfortunately, fluid models should be fully deterministic to enable theoretical analysis. So the best we can actually do is kind of to um, achieve the goal that was intended with the randomization, but uh, to achieve it without actually doing the randomization. So achieve the same goal with deterministic means. And in this case here, the goal of the, of the randomization was to desynchronize the probing behavior across uh, BBR flows uh, and uh, such that not all flows look for more bandwidth at the same time. And uh, in our, in the deterministic fluid model, we can achieve this goal of desynchronization with a simple trick. So we just assign a natural number as a flow ID uh, uh, to the uh, competing flows. And then we'll calculate this flow ID modulo seven to get the phase phi i in which flow i has the upwards pulse. So if we were to uh, simulate 10 flows, then flow one would have its upwards pulse in phase one, flow seven would have its upwards pulse in phase zero, and so on. So the natural number is calculated by, uh, by is computed modulo seven, although there are eight phases in a probing period, but this is because the upwards pulse is, is actually never inserted into the last phase of a BBR probing period. And this uh, trick of desynchronization actually achieves uh, the desynchronization as is evidenced here by the pacing rates uh, of flow one, flow seven, and flow nine. So the, the next bit of challenging BBR functionality is to track the maximum delivery rate over time. Um, to achieve this, we again rely on the sigmoid function increasing from zero to one for an argument around zero. But this time we multiply the sigmoid function by a linear function to get this function gamma here. This function gamma yields zero for an argument below zero and yields the identity for an argument above zero. So this approximates what is commonly known as the rectified linear unit. Um, and we can use this function gamma to construct a differential equation um, that, that uh, reflects this evolution of the maximum delivery rate over time. So specifically, if we have an arbitrary evolution of the delivery rate here in blue, this gamma will cause the current maximum to be adjusted upwards to the delivery rate if the delivery rate is above the maximum, uh, but will preserve the current maximum otherwise. Uh, so with this, we kind of can track this maximum delivery rate with pure differential equations. Finally, um, so bear with me, this is the last slide of maths. Um, so this, this, max, this maximum tracking has then uh, to be eventually adopted as the new bottleneck bandwidth estimate. And to do that, we once more rely on the sigmoid function and we once more create a pulse. However, this time we don't uh, create a pulse that covers an entire phase, but we just cover, uh, we just create a pulse that covers the really last few milliseconds um, of, of the entire probing period. So here, if you have the, the, la the second, the last four phases of a probing period, um, we can create a pulse at the period end by using a sigmoid function that increases shortly before the period end and another sigmoid function that decreases right at the period end and we multiply them to get this pulse. And then we can use this pulse in, a, uh, in an another differential equation um, that adjusts, uh, that takes basically the, the maximum delivery rate that has been tracked over time and adjusts the bottleneck bandwidth estimates towards that maximum at the end of the probing period when the pulse is actually non-zero. So all the math I just showed you is just a very small part um, of our BBR fluid model. And I encourage you to read the full paper to discover how we uh, represented the whole BBR functionality with differential equations. More important for our purpose here, we find that our BBR fluid model represents BBR functionality quite well. So both for BBR version one and BBR version two, 
and both for the drop tail and the random early drop queuing disciplines. And this brings me to the second part of our contribution, namely the experimental validation. So in this experimental validation, we validated our fluid model under a variety of network settings and under a variety of configurations. So each configuration consisted of a single bottleneck topology and a combination of congestion control algorithms. So we test both homogeneous uh, combinations where all competing flows adopt the same congestion control algorithm. And we also test heterogeneous balanced combinations where each congestion control algorithm is adopted by the same number of competing flows. For each of these configurations, we run two evaluation tools. One are uh, a simulator that is based on our fluid model. So that basically solves the differential equations in the fluid model and an experiment environment that is based on the Mininet network evaluator. From these evaluation tools, we get results and we compare these results to conduct the validation. We conduct uh, two different types of validation. One is a trace validation that looks at the evolution of network metrics over time. Uh, this is the plot that I've just shown. And we also conduct an aggregate result validation, which I will talk about now. So importantly, in this validation, we do not only find that our fluid model is very accurate, but we can also confirm previous insights into BBR performance and generate new insights. So to start with uh, previous insights, uh, our fluid model correctly predicts that BBR version 1 is quite unfair towards loss-based congestion control algorithms uh, in shallow buffers. Um, and this is demonstrated by this uh, plot uh, down here. So on the left, uh, we have the predictions uh, by the fluid model. And on the right, we have the experiment results uh, from the Mininet network evaluator. And on the x-axis, we have the buffer size uh, of the bottleneck uh, in multiples of the path bandwidth delay product. And on the y-axis, we have the chain fairness index, which would be one for perfect fairness and zero if a single flow obtained all the bandwidth. And here we see that our fluid model correctly predicts that up to a, a buffer size of four, um, bandwidth, uh, four, four bandwidth delay products, um, the BBR flows actually obtain almost the complete bandwidth uh, when they compete with cubic flows or uh, Reno flows. Um, our fluid model also correctly predicts that uh, BBR version 2 has largely eliminated uh, this issue. So BBR version 2 is considerably more fair towards cubic uh, and Reno. But note that this results uh, relate to a drop tail queuing discipline. And we find uh, also by means of our fluid model that BBR version 2 is actually uh, still considerably unfair to cubic and reno under a random early drop uh, queuing discipline. And uh, this is noteworthy that uh, this is an insight that has not been documented uh, officially anywhere before. So our fluid model really was the first tool to uh, deliver this insight. Uh, and to go to another previous insight, um, our fluid model um, correctly predicts that BBR version 1 also leads to high loss in shallow buffers. That's actually the root cause of the uh, unfairness of BBR version 1 that we have this, uh, discovered, bef uh, that we uh, have discussed before. And the fluid model correctly predicts that BBR version 2 leads to very little loss, comp uh, like loss on the order of that is caused by the traditional loss-based congestion control algorithms. So for a new insight, uh, our fluid models identifies this buffering behavior here of BBR version 2, uh, which is uh, previously un undocumented. So here we see that uh, if the buffer size grows, the buffer utilization by BBR version 2 first decreases, but then increases again. And this came, to, uh, came as a surprise to us. So uh, why did we observe this effect? Um, to see why, uh, let's consider the probing behavior uh, bandwidth probing behavior of PBR version 2 and how it adapts the data volume in flight over time. So generally, PBR tries to keep the data in flight at uh, the estimate of the bandwidth delay product. But in order to discover whether more bandwidth is, is available, this, band, uh, this data in flight is regularly increased to a certain multiple of the bandwidth delay product. However, this in-flight increase is stopped early if excessive loss is detected or if the in-flight high mark is hit. 
And this in-flight high mark is maybe set in the startup phase of the BBR version 2 flow, but also only if excessive loss is, detect is detected. Now, the key insight here is that in large buffers, barely any loss occurs. And that's why uh, large buffers actually disable these loss-based safeguards in BBR version 2. As a result, um, this in-flight increase uh, never stops early. So that means BBR version 2 probes more aggressively in large buffers. That's why it me measures a higher delivery rate. This measurement of the delivery rate enters into the estimate of the bandwidth delay product. And um, that means that BBR version 2 keeps even more um, data in flight, which then leads to a higher buffer utilization. And that's why we observe this U-shaped curve. Uh, so a steady state model would actually have difficulty to predict this effect because it's an effect that unfolds over time. However, our fluid model, since it's dynamic, actually can reproduce this dynamic effect. So one category of insights that I just discussed came from this experimental validation. Another category of insights that we had came from our uh, theoretical stability analysis. So what do I exactly mean by a theoretical stability analysis? In this, in a theoretical stability analysis, we started with the fluid model that I've uh, talked about now. And uh, this fluid model uh, can be used for simulation and can, be, uh, can also reflect the small scale features of the sending rate evolution in BBR. So the, the probing pulses that we see here uh, in these sending rate curves. However, we then reduce this fluid, uh, full fluid model to a high level model that reflects the macroscopic behavior uh, of, of BBR uh, in terms of sending rate. And this reduced fluid model is much more suitable for theoretical pen and paper analysis. Then uh, with respect to the, this reduced fluid model, we find the equilibria, so the steady states, which here are a, co a combination of a sending rate distribution and the Q length from which the sending rate dynamics do not deviate anymore. So combinations which are preserved by the sending rate dynamics. And lastly, we can then investigate this equilibria with respect to their asymptotic stability. If these equilibria are asymptotically stable, that means that BBR in fact converges to these steady states. And we can uh, prove this by means of tools from stability analysis, such as the uh, Lyapunov method. So that's how the um, stability analysis works. So let's see what results it generated. So in our stability analysis, we um, investigated different uh, types of equilibria, we distinguished BBR version 1 and BBR version 2. And for BBR version 1, we also distinguished deep buffers and shallow buffers. For BBR version 1 equilibria in deep buffers, uh, we find that these um, equilibria are not unique. So that means there are multiple possible sending rate distribution to which BBR uh, might converge even in the same configurations. And uh, crucially, not all of the sending rate distributions are necessarily fair. The BBR can converge to unfair equilibria. However, some of these sending rate distributions are actually fair, so fairness, fair equilibria is still possible. Also, uh, positively, these BBR1 equilibria in deep buffers do not involve uh, persistent packet loss, and they're asymptotically stable, so we actually have a mathematical guarantee that BBR converges eventually. Then for shallow buffers, we find different uh, equilibrium properties, uh, interestingly. So here we find that equilibria are in fact unique. They are guaranteed to be fair, um, and they're also stable. Um, however, they do involve persistent packet loss. And for BBR version 2, finally, we find more or less the same properties as for BBR version 1 equilibria in deep buffers uh, with mo one small change. So B Fairness in BBR version 2 equilibria is actually guaranteed under the same round trip time for all flows and the same uh, guarantee, uh, the same conditions do not guarantee fairness for BBR version 1. So there's kind of improvement in that respect. So uh, I would like to note here that in all the investigated cases, we uh, could confirm the stability of BBR. However, we have some follow-up work that shows that the stability of BBR does not hold if BBR competes with a traditional loss-based congestion control algorithm. And um, we hope to be able to uh, publish these results soon. So with this, I've provided an overview of all our contributions in the paper, and I would like to make some concluding remarks. And I would like to split these um, concluding remarks in two parts, one relating to fluid models 
and one to relating to BBR and congestion control in general. So in terms of fluid models, I think our work shows that fluid models predict congestion control behavior with surprising accuracy. This accuracy is qualitative, so it allows to kind of rank um, congestion control algorithms with respect to certain metrics. And it's also quantitative, uh, quantitatively accurate. So it gives, uh, it predicts with quite high accuracy, for example, how loss will the, uh, how high will the loss rate be? And therefore, uh, in our opinion, fluid models are a valuable complement to experiments in steady state models. So the other two methods that have traditionally been used in BBR analysis, uh, we do not think of fluid models as a replacement of these methods in any way, because experiments are still the gold standard um, in, in evaluation and steady state models are much easier to work with uh, theoretically. However, this combination of these three methods is actually quite a powerful tool set to anal analyze congestion control algorithms. And uh, we also see a possibility for fluid models uh, to support eventual uh, standardization efforts. So if BBR was, were to be ever standardized, a fluid models analysis could help to recommend some parameters. Uh, such parameter recommendation was, for example, done in, uh, for earlier congestion control algorithms. Now turning to PBR and congestion control, I think the overall verdict of our fluid model-driven PBR analysis is that PBR version 2 remains an incomplete improvement over PBR version 1. So PBR version 2 eliminates the worst fairness and loss issues of PBR version 1. However, it still leads to uh, some buffer queuing behavior uh, in, in, other, in other cases that might, might not be desirable. Um, and the, I think these tenacious perf performance issues just indicate that internet congestion control is just really hard to get right. And I would like to note this point as exactly this difficulty has recently motivated some proposals to support congestion control algorithms uh, with resource allocation mechanisms that run in the network. So there have been uh, proposals for congestion shares at hotnets three years ago but there's also the proposal for bandwidth reservation in Scion that my colleagues uh, at ETH Zurich work on. Um, however, I uh, would expect that these proposals are at least somewhat controversial. And of course, these proposals also will have a long way to go um, to be practically usable in the internet. Um, so at least in the short term, the efficiency, fairness, and stability of internet congestion control uh, remains an important research objective and hopefully our fluid model can help achieve this goal. So with that, I've arrived at the end of my talk. Um, I'm happy to take questions and I thank you all for your attention. All right, thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Um, I think it's uh, re really nice that this uh, both confirms some of the prior experimental results and, and made some new predictions, uh, which we're then able to, to pull out. Uh, does anyone have any questions for, for Simon? Go for it. Hey, uh, Cedric Westfall with uh, FutureWay. Um, uh, my question was, I, I don't see in, in the model where you have the buffer drop behavior. Like you mm -hmm. said, our, um, red is, is better than uh, drop tail or the other way, whatever. But uh, where, where did that come in into the model? Uh, yeah, so I we briefly see just on one slide. Uh, okay. So yeah, here. So this actually gives a brief overview of our complete fluid model. Um, so our fluid model actually has more or less two parts on the highest level structure. One is the network model that describes um, basically the response of the networks that is the leftmost column here. And um, there in the, in the differential equation that captures the queuing behavior, we can um, distinguish between drop tail and random early drop. And another question as well was the, um, uh, do you use, like you have a more advanced way of, of modeling uh, the dynamics of, of the queue than the 
previous uh, TCP models? Do you uh, use yeah. updated models for Cubic or Reno as well? Or? Um, so for the network part of the model, uh, most of this kind of network response modeling has been done in previous work, but we refined this model uh, in a few ways that actually obtain, uh, allowed us to obtain more accurate results. But for the uh, congestion control algorithm models themselves, um, we just use previous work. Uh, this has been done before. Okay. Hi, I had a quick question. Yeah. So if in the, in the cases where you're application limited, is there any way to adapt the model to kind of handle, handle those cases? I didn't see a way that any of the functions you're using could capture that behavior. Uh, and your name, sorry. Uh, David Morley, Google. Um, yeah, so it's definitely not in the model yet, um, but I think um, the model already has some some places where, like, the the rate is constrained. Uh, more most prominently, for example, the the sending rate is constrained by the congestion window of BBR, and this could like the application limit could just uh, be accommodated as another constraint. But so far, we ha have not done this. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, hi, hi, Simon. Thanks yeah. for presenting this. Um, coming from me as a non-mathematician and not yeah. really understanding the consequences of that, I wondered if you could tell us something about the scalability of it. I saw you um, showing in a real-life experiment three flows, uh, comparing to three flows that you did the computations at points in time using the fluid model. Can it be done for like a million of these flows, or is it just computationally infeasible? Are there things that we could answer if we could scale it up more? Like, how does it actually yeah. operate? What is it? Um, yeah. So, um, for example, these simulation computations here, um, they were done uh, for ten flows, and this uh, runs through very quickly. Um, and actually, simulating one flow is not that expensive. What becomes expensive if you have a large scale network topology um, because you then have to kind of gather the feedback from all the queues on the path and uh, there it becomes expensive. But um, I think with uh, enough computing power, you can still the, the results are, or the, the simulation based approach based on the fluid model uh, is still quite scalable. Yeah. Can I ask one more thing about yeah. that then? If you so, if you were to scale it up with multiple queues in a real mm -hmm. like campus set of routers, is is uh, would you want to have to build the experiment to convince yourself that the flow model still works, or do, or do, do your results already show that it will work with larger networks? So I think the um, the experimental validation that we already did gives uh, some confidence uh, that our fluid model yields reasonable predictions. And I think what's, what we especially envisioned for the fluid models to do is kind of deliver quickly some first insights um, that can then maybe investigate it more closely uh, with experiments. Uh, so, but then you don't have to do the experiments for all the variety of, uh, of network configurations. So that's how we see these two approaches play together. Okay, thank you. Um, can I just ask, does this model the startup dynamics or is it just the steady uh, state? No, so fluid yeah. models in congestion control research uh, abstract uh, the startup and just model the con congestion avoidance. Okay. Yeah. Um, but like, if we wanted to model the, the startup uh, fa phase or if we wanted to investigate the startup phase, we basically have two options. We either we could uh, just generate another or construct another fluid model just for the startup phase and then at some point switch over in the simulation or we could just evaluate the fluid model under a variety uh, of initial conditions so initial conditions for differential equation and then we could actually um, evaluate the bbr under a variety of startup behaviors okay cool cool all right does anyone else have any other questions I guess my I guess my other my, my final okay. question in that case would be um, can you model BBR version three? What changed? Uh, yeah, so I I was at the CCWG meeting on Tuesday and I saw what was presented and I I think the changes that were presented are quite easy to accommodate in the in the fluid model. Yeah. Okay. Good. 
All right. Uh, are there any more questions for Simon? Okay. In that case, thank you and congratulations once again. We have a uh, small uh, gift to show. Oh, appreciate oh, yeah. We have a we have a small gift to uh, to show our appreciation. So, uh, congratulations. Yeah. All right, so uh, as I say, uh, unfortunately, the, the other award winner uh, is, is sick and so can't uh, give his talk today, and we will reschedule that talk uh, for the November meeting. So that's the, the conclusion of this meeting. Uh, again, congratulations to Simon, congratulations to Shiva, who will give his talk uh, later in the year, uh, and thank you all for your attention, and I will hopefully see you all in Prague.